Well, I am so glad that you have joined us today for worship, where we get to praise and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and what he has done on the cross for us. All right, and so this morning, we are looking at the passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1 through 10. And these 10 verses are packed full of amazing truths, and this morning, we are going to unpack some of those truths today. So go ahead and open your bulletins. We are going to go ahead and read that passage. Um, So follow along. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. The word of the Lord. And so we see from this passage that Paul, he's extremely happy and thankful for the Thessalonians. And he has, really, he has many reasons to be thankful as well. People have spoken about their faith and that their faith has been an example for all the people in that region, in Macedonia and Achaia. They've been a model for others and the gospel has been heard and spread throughout the land because of their faith. The Thessalonians are an example of good and faithful servants serving Jesus Christ and because of their faith, others have experienced the gospel. And that's why Paul is extremely happy and thankful for them and for their faith. They have an active faith, a faith that faithfully serves Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God. And when I reflect on this passage in Thessalonians about how they were faithful servants and models for other believers, I think of two of my youth leaders that I had growing up as a kid. Have you ever encountered someone or met someone who was just filled with the Holy Spirit from the way they talk, from the way they carry themselves, the way they serve God, and ultimately the way they show God's love to other people. And you just know they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And from your interactions with them, you experience God's love. You experience true fellowship. And that was my experience with two of my youth leaders growing up as a kid. My family recently just switched um, churches, and I started going to youth group for the first time on Wednesday nights. I believe I was a junior at the time. And I remember one night, the youth pastor comes up to me and he asked me this question. He said, hey, Christian, there's a spot that just opened up on our mission trip to Mexico. Will you be willing to go? Well, at the time, I've been only going to the church for about four weeks. So I was super new, didn't know anybody. And also, the mission trip was in two months. And so I had two months to fundraise and gather the money to go to Mexico. And so there was a lot of things that were going against me, right? I didn't know anybody. I was new. And I only had two months to fundraise for the money, while everyone else has had six months to fundraise for the mission trip. Well, I eventually said yes, and it turned out to be a pivotal point in my life. 
And the reason why I said yes was because the youth pastor, he told me that he was praying to God and asking God to place a person in his mind to ask to go on the mission trip. And God placed my name in my youth pastor's mind. And because of that, I grew in my faith. And the mission trip that I went on, I eventually became super close with my youth pastor and my youth leader. And over the next several years, we became super close. We went on another mission trip together. We became good friends. They went to my high school and college graduation parties. And as a 16 and 17 year old kid, they were my role models. They were the people I modeled myself after. And I grew in my faith because of their faith. They let their faith shine. And because of that, I'm the person that I am today because of who they were. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Our calling to be the light of the world, to let our faith shine, to be the light in this dark and broken world. Our faith is not meant to be hidden, but God calls us to be active workers in the kingdom of God. He calls us to have an active faith working and working for the kingdom of God, and he calls us to be an example and a model for other people as well. And the reason why I love this passage is because it's full of richness and truth. And Paul, in this passage, talks about where it all begins, and that's the gospel. Hearing and receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's look at verse 4 and 5. It says this, For we know, brothers and sisters loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. That's where all of our spiritual journeys, that's where all of our faith walk begins. Hearing and receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's my first point of my sermon today. The gospel has the power to change lives. The gospel came not only with simple words, but it came with power. It came with the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, it has a deep conviction in your hearts. The gospel is not just words or just stories that were written down thousands of years ago that we hear or we read about in Sunday school or in church. But the gospel is alive, right? It comes with power and the Holy Spirit is living and working through all of us through the gospel. Now, Thessalonica was the capital city of Macedonia, the northern province of what is now Greece. It was probably the most important city of that region as well. It was located at the intersection of four major roads, and archaeologists believe that there's 100,000 people who lived in the city at the time. And so it's just a little bit smaller than the Quad City um, region that we are a part of. And so Paul goes to Thessalonica on his second missionary journey, and you can read all about his journey in Acts 17. And when when Paul arrives at the city, he does what he always does. He goes to the synagogue and preaches to the Jews. He preaches to them on why the Messiah, Jesus, why he had to suffer, why he had to die, and why he had to be raised from the dead. And we also learn in Acts 17 that some of the Jews, they end up believing what, uh, what Paul was teaching. But there was also a large group of God-fearing Greeks who also believed as well. And so, However, the rest of the Jews, they became angry, they became resentful, and they became jealous. And so they forced Paul, Silas, and Timothy to leave the city. And the book of Acts records that Paul was teaching in the synagogues, but his ministry and his teaching took on a broader sense and it reached more people than just the Jews and the people in the synagogues. Because we read in this passage that Paul refers to the recipients of this letter as people who have turned from idols. So it's not just Jews and God-fearing Greeks who heard the gospel, but it was also pagans, right? Pa people who worship pagan gods. They also heard the message, they also heard the gospel, and they repented and they turned away from their idols. So let's look at verse 9 and 10. For they, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols who serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Now, there's a couple of things that we are going to talk about in this verse. And 
the first thing is that the recipients of the letters, they turned away from the idols and they turned to the one true living God, which is Yahweh. Right? And archaeologists, they have found temples and shrines for deities such as Isis, Osiris, Serapis, and Kabaris in Thessalonica. So the Thessalonians, they were, they were very much pagans and they worshipped pagan gods. But when Paul, Timothy, and Silas came to them and they preached the gospel, they received the gospel, they received the Holy Spirit, and they accepted Jesus into their hearts, and they turned away from those idols. And that brings me back to their first point. The gospel has the power to change your life. When Paul and his team went to them and preached to them, they received the Holy Spirit. They received the gospel. They received Jesus Christ within their hearts. And because of that, they turned away from their pagan gods. And they turned to the one true living God. Now, the Greek word that's used for conviction here is the word pleophoria. It means full of assurance, certainty, conviction, and firm persuasion. And so when the gospel was preached, the Thessalonians, they were full of confidence. They were assured. They were convicted in their hearts that what Paul was teaching was true and correct. And that what they were preaching was the true God. Now in today's world, you might not be worshiping pagan gods like the Thessalonians. But we still battle with worshiping idols today. They just come in different names and different forms today. For instance, maybe you struggle with idolizing money or idolizing material things. Maybe it's alcohol and drugs. Maybe it's your work. Maybe it's the status of your work, trying to achieve everything you can. Maybe it's your physical appearance. These are all things in the world and the, and the culture that we live in today that competes with your loyalty for Jesus Christ. Idolatry is the worship of images that are not truly God, but are treated like gods. In essence, you are worshiping a false god and replacing the one true God with these idols like money, alcohol, drugs, sex, the way you look. And we see from this passage that when you fully receive the power of God and receive the gospel, the Holy Spirit sets you free from this. It sets you free from these idols. It sets you free from the lies that the devil is telling you. And it sets you free from the ideas that are like, hey, Maybe I just need more money to be considered successful. Or, hey, I need to look a certain way. Or, hey, I need to act and behave in an ungodly way like everyone else at work and school just to fit in or just to be part of the cool club. Right? When you receive the gospel, it frees you from all of those idols that we face in today's world. And when we receive the gospel, it fixes your eyes on the one true God and fix, fixes your perception on reality, and it breaks all the lies that the devil is telling you. The gospel has the power to change your life and to set you free from the shackles of this world, just like it did with the Thessalonians. And it all begins with our encounter with Jesus Christ. It all begins with our relationship with Jesus and Paul had his Jesus moment, his Jesus encounter on the road to Damascus. And ever since then, he never turned back. But he did everything in his willpower to further the kingdom of God. And he was living out his faith, a faith that was active. And so maybe you're waiting for that moment, waiting for that time where Jesus encounters you and changes your hearts and brings you to the cross and brings you down onto your knees. And maybe that moment is today, and if it is, we have those wonderful prayer warriors who will love to pray with you after the service by the cross over here. It all begins and ends with Jesus. And that leads to my second point of the sermon today, and you are called to live like Jesus. When you receive the gospel and receive Jesus into your hearts, you're called to live like Jesus lived. As followers of Jesus, we are called to imitate the way he lived on this planet. Let's look at verse 6. It says this, You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of se severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. The Thessalonians, they became imitators of Paul, Silas, and Timothy, but most importantly, they became imitators of Jesus Christ. 
Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 says this, Follow my example as I have followed the example of Christ. We are believers of Jesus and we are called to believe or we are called to live like him and to follow his example. We are called to imitate him. And I love what one of the authors says about imitation versus mimicking. When we imitate someone, we follow someone's external, but we also follow their internal behaviors with the intention of being like them. When we imitate Jesus Christ, we not only do what he did, but we also do it for the same reasons as well. For instance, when Jesus prayed to our Father in heaven, he did it out of love, and so he can be in communion with our Father in heaven. And when Jesus gave to the poor, he did it out of love. So everything that we do, we need to do it out of love as well. But when you mimic someone, you're copying someone else's behavior for entertainment or typically to ridicule their behavior. And we can make the mistake of copying, some, or we can make the mistake of trying to copy Jesus' actions, but when we do it not out of love and not with the same intentions that he has, we mimic Jesus and we don't imitate what he does. And 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 to 6 says this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Our imitation of Jesus begins with our obedience, our submission, and our love of God. The first step in imitating Jesus is by having a deep and intimate relationship with him where we allow him to come into our hearts, we draw close to him, we get to know him, and we get to hear his voice, and we get to know his character and all his desires. You allow him, to, allow him into your heart to know every aspect of who you are. This is what it means to have a deep and intimate relationship with Jesus where you love him with all your heart, you love him with all your soul, and you love him with all your mind and your strength. But it, Jesus also commands us and tells us that we need to love others as well, to love our neighbors like how he has loved us. And ultimately, Jesus lived his life by serving others. Jesus humbled himself to the point of being crucified on the cross for our sins, and Jesus now asks all of us to do the same thing as well. This means that we need to feed the hungry and the thirsty, to, to help the poor and the needy, to provide for the marginalized. These are all things that Jesus did in his ministry, and these are all things that Jesus is calling us to do as well. And this brings me to my favorite verse in the passage, which is verse 3. So follow along as I read that. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are three things in, the ver in this verse that stands out. And the first thing is that your work produced by faith. We know from Paul's other letters that salvation only comes through faith and not by the works of the law. In Galatians, Paul specifically says that you are not justified by the works of the law, but you are saved, you are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. But Paul also argues and tells us that true faith produces works, right? True faith is active and it's alive. Our faith is not something that should be sidelined, but it should be active and alive working for the kingdom of God. When we encounter Jesus and when we encounter his love, we accept him into our hearts and our faith leads us and moves us to serve others. We are called to have an active faith working for the kingdom of God. And it's super important to note in this verse how it says, our work is produced by faith. Faith produces our work, not the other way around. And then the second thing in this verse that stands out is that your labor is prompted by love. The Greek word that's used here denotes labors, toil, and hardship. Something that is not easy. And what we learn from this is that the love of God prompts us to do things that is hard and laborious at times. It's not going to be easy all the time when we come and when we encounter people. There will always be moments and situations as Christians where we come across people 
where it's hard to love them, but God still calls us to love them either way. Love prompts us to love our neighbors no matter what, even when it's hard. And then the third part of this verse is endurance inspired by hope. The Thessalonians received the gospel in the midst of severe suffering and, and they, were, they received severe suffering and objections from others and they were being persecuted by the other Jews and the other Thessalonians. However, their hope allowed them to endure the hardest things that they face. And then what I love the most about this verse is the way it ends and it says this, in our Lord Jesus Christ. None of this will be possible without Jesus Christ. The good works that is produced by faith, the love of God that prompts our labor, the hope that inspires our endurance, endurance is all done by Jesus Christ. It is all founded in Him. And that leads to my last point I want to make this morning, and is, and is this. Your faith becomes a model for others. In this passage, we see that the faith of the Thessalonians become a model, an example for other people in, the, in this region. And their faith is well known. And because of their faith, the gospel is spread throughout the land. And then Matthew 5, chap, or Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 16 says this. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and gives it light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. All right, your faith is not meant to be hidden. It's not meant to be sidelined or inactive. It's meant to be active. It's meant to be alive. It's meant to be working for the kingdom of God. That's what your faith is meant to be. And in this Matthew passage, we see that our faith is to be the light of this world. So let me ask you, are you currently living in a way that your faith shines as a light? Will others experience Jesus through you when they encounter you? Will you have a positive impact in their lives? Will you bring Jesus to them by the way you talk, by the way you carry yourselves, and by the way you interact with other people? Will they encounter Jesus through you? And one of my favorite movies, movie series is the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit series. I love these movies. And Gandalf has one of my favorite movie quotes of all time. He says this, Saruman believes it is only great power that can hold evil in check. But this is not what I have found. It is the small everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keep the darkness at bay. Small acts of kindness and love. Small acts of kindness and love. And when you came in this morning, you should have seen this, these little candles on your seats. And so there's a little switch on the bottom of these candles. Don't turn them on yet. All right, wait for my instructions. Um, but can, Deb, can you go ahead and turn off the lights for me? All right, it's pretty dark, all right. <laughs> but yeah, this just represents the sinful and the broken world that we live in, doesn't it? Our world is very broken. Our world is full of violence, it's full of sin, it's full of confusion, lies, and deceit that the devil tells us. When we look at the younger generations, they're being filled with lies and deceit. They're being pu pulled further away from the truth. We also see that there's war happening in this world. Look at what's happening between Russia and Ukraine, Palestine and Israel. Innocent people, innocent kids are dying every single day and it breaks my heart. The brokenness in this world is like this dark room. All right? You can't see. It's hard. But when we live out our faith, when we take our faith and we act on it, Something beautiful happens, all right? A little light like this can begin to shine and take the darkness out of this world. And so I invite all of you guys to turn on all your candles now and join me. All 
All right, there we go. But look around. When we start to shine our lights, when we start to shine our faith, we take the darkness out of this world. We begin to light and bring the goodness in this world through small acts of kindness. And I want you guys to look at the cross over there. Look at how it glows in this dark room. And even though we live in a broken and sinful world, the cross will always shine no matter what. No, ma no matter how dark, no matter how broken, no matter how sinful our world is, what Jesus has done on the cross will always bring light. And that's my first point of the sermon, right? The gospel will always change your life. It comes with power. It comes with the Holy Spirit. And so you guys can go ahead and turn off your candles. But I have a challenge for you guys today. We are all called to have an active faith. We are all called to live out our faith and to spread the love of Jesus Christ and to spread the gospel. And so my challenge for you today is how are you going to show a small act of kindness to someone you don't know? How are you going to show a small act of kindness and love to someone who you might not know? It might be someone at the store. Maybe you buy them coffee. Maybe you take them out to lunch. Or maybe you take out your favorite vicar out to lunch or dinner. You know, you never know. I'm always hungry. <laughs> but there's ways for you to act on and bring the love of Jesus Christ through small acts of kindness. That is the way we have been called by God, to share our faith, to share the love of Jesus Christ to others. And so let us pray.